Welcome. My name is Daphne Weisham, and I'd like to welcome you all to the first US webinar on methane removal hosted by Methane Action. I'm the CEO of Methane Action, a small nonprofit organization with a bold vision. Our mission is to pursue the science and policy advances needed under careful global governance to rapidly restore atmospheric methane, a potent greenhouse gas, to pre-industrial levels for the benefit of present and future generations. And by methane action, we mean we support both rapidly reducing methane emissions wherever we can and where we can't to advance methane removal in order to deal with those methane emissions that can't be avoided. We are going to hold questions until after the scientific panel ends, roughly at the bottom of uh, the hour, when we will open up questions for Sir David King, Rob Jackson, and Renaud de Richter. And then we will proceed to the governance panel. And after that, we will have time for uh, additional Q&A. We will be losing Sir David um, after the uh, initial half hour and the Q&A initially. Um, so journalists should note that in addition to today's Q&A, you can also request interviews with any of today's presenters by contacting our communications director, Stephen Kent, and I am putting his contact information in the chat. We are delighted to be joined today by both Congresswoman Shelley Pingree of Maine and Sir David King of Cambridge. Congresswoman Pingree has prepared a short pre-recorded comment to kick things off, after which we will hear from our keynote speaker, Sir David King. So let me cue this up. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Shelley Pingree, representing Maine's beautiful first district. From my time as a student at College of the Atlantic to the Maine State Legislature and now in Congress, I have been working to combat and mitigate climate change for decades. And as chair of the House Appropriations Subcommittee on the Interior Environment, which oversees funding for the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of the Interior, the Forest Service, and more, I am on the front lines of whole of government action to fight the climate crisis. Maine is already acutely affected by the climate crisis and the natural resources that make our state beautiful and valuable are under a massive threat. The Gulf of Maine, for example, is warming faster than 99% of other bodies of water on the planet. A recent study found that the rapid warming of the 20th century has reversed 900 years of cooling in the Gulf of Maine that occurred prior to the 1800s. This has huge implications on our coastal ecosystem, on our economy, on our way of life, like how warming the Gulf is driving lobsters and other species north to Canada, disrupting fishing and tourism industries that are the backbone of coastal economies. Increasing global methane levels are one of the reasons why the Gulf of Maine is among the fastest warming bodies of water on Earth. In 2020, Methane accounted for about 11% of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions from human activities. But methane is far more efficient at trapping radiation than carbon dioxide, with a comparative impact of methane that is 25 times greater than carbon dioxide over a 100-year period. Reducing methane emissions will therefore have an outsized impact on the total warming effect of our atmosphere from human-sourced greenhouse gases. That's why I've proudly fought for reductions in greenhouse gas emissions in Congress. As chair of the House Interior Appropriations Subcommittee, I'm working with the EPA and other agencies to advance the research on methane emissions. In addition to the unprecedented investments to fight the climate crisis in the fiscal year 2022 and 23 appropriations bill, I was thrilled to help pass the Inflation Reduction Act, the most significant climate investment in US history that includes massive support for reducing emissions, including a new methane emissions reduction program to reduce links, re leaks from the oil and gas sector, the leading industrial emitter of methane. To reduce the levels of methane in the atmosphere, we must of course dedicate ourselves to emitting less, but by also advancing the research on methane removal and sequestration. 
The Inflation Reduction Act will help make this possible. By investing $369 billion in climate and energy, the Inflation Reduction Act puts us on a path to reduce emissions 40% by 2030. There is also funding to accelerate breakthrough energy research, which is a vital part of learning how we can restore our climate and assure a sustainable future. We're already feeling the impacts of climate change, but it is not too late to act. I'm proud to be in this fight with you. Thank you. I'm honored to welcome our keynote speaker, Sir David King. Professor Sir David King is Emeritus Professor of Chemistry, University of Cambridge, founder and chair of the Center for Climate Repair in the University of Cambridge, chair of the Climate Crisis Advisory Group, and recipient of the AAAS Betty and David Hamburg Award for Science Diplomacy in 2022. He was the UK government chief scientific advisor from 2000 to 2007, the foreign secretary special representative on climate change from 2013 to 2017. He has traveled widely to persuade all countries to act on climate change. He initiated an in-depth risk analysis approach to climate change, working with the governments of China and India. He initiated a collaborative program now known as Mission Innovation to create a 23 billion pound per annum research and development international exercise to deliver all technologies needed to complete the transition into a fossil fuel free world economy. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us, Sir David. Well, Daphne, thank you very much uh, um, for uh, giving that rather lengthy introduction. Um, and I'm going to correct you a little bit and say my name is Dave. Uh, so just to kick off, I've got to say, first of all, that when we listen to many, many people who are concerned about climate change, they talk about the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere being 420 parts per million. That is the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Another correction, methane is instantaneously, not over a hundred year period, is instantaneously more than a hundred times more effective per molecule than uh, carbon dioxide. And so methane levels are now rising faster than ever before and are a big contributor to the way in which the world is now shifting. And I have to say, we are in a crisis already. So yes, methane, the subject of this conference is not sufficiently focused on uh, for all sorts of reasons. But let me just now dwell on the state of the planet as it is today. Uh, we have last week a critically important paper published in Science on the tipping points. And in that paper, it sets out the fact that at 1.5 degrees, we're already seeing tipping points going that impact on the whole world. But at three degrees, we've got a whole series of tipping points that are well in the way of any form of manageable planet for humanity. Now, the bad news is that if you look at the Arctic Circle region, it has been heating up at four times the rate of the rest, rest of the planet's average over the last 20 years. And what that means is that the Arctic Circle is now more than three degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level for the Arctic Circle. So when we look at the tipping points in the Arctic Circle, we understand they have irreversibly gone unless there's an intervention. And so here's the, the dreadful situation we're in. The Arctic Circle tipping points have gone. The reason is the Arctic Circle has lost the ice that was covering the Arctic Ocean for so many thousands of years. And, and during the polar summer months, during those three, three North Pole summer months. And the, the consequences of this are quite simply enormous for the whole planet. Greenland now sits in that blue Arctic Ocean soaking up sunshine, whereas, of course, 
the albedo of the ice is such that the ice was reflecting sunshine back into space. The consequence is that, and I say this carefully, Greenland ice is now melting irreversibly. Six and a half, seven meters sea level rise are on the cards right now. We're not, we're not having to look a long way ahead to see these enormous challenges arising from this. And now comes the serious business about methane. In the landmass around the Arctic Circle, I'm sorry, around the North Pole, where the Arctic Ocean is, we have a vast amount of permafrost. And in the permafrost is a vast amount of methane hydrate. And methane hydrate is now bubbling up on many, many parts of the permafrost during those three polar summer months. And the temperatures in that region are now sometimes approaching plus 30, plus 32 degrees centigrade the boreal forests catching fire because they are experiencing lightning for the first time in any human record and the boreal forests on fire those forests that have been there for many many hundreds of years is a major challenge to the people the inuit and the sami people living in that region but also for the whole planet because the release of methane from methane hydrate as the permafrost heats up is potentially disastrous. There's enough methane there that if it was all emitted in simply five, five sorry, in simply 20 years, the lifetime half-life of methane in the atmosphere is about 10 to 12 years, so that's about two half-lives, could lead to a temperature rise of five to eight degrees centigrade for the whole planet. And this is already beginning to happen. So what, what we see is the consequences of the Arctic Circle melting and the, all of this is the extreme weather events we've been experiencing, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere during exactly those three summer months. And if you, if you create warm air over the North Pole, the cold air that was protected by the jet stream going around the North Pole, protecting the warm air from the south going into the uh, North Pole region and the cold air from the North Pole coming down. It's a very strong wind. That wind is now massively distorted. And those distortions really lead to most of the extreme weather events we're observing now. What I'm saying is we're in a situation which demands a new look at the safe management of the planet going forward for humanity and for our biodiverse systems. And that safe management means recognizing, yes, deep and rapid emissions reduction is critical. We're emitting, including methane, of course, more than 45 billion tons of greenhouse gases a year. But if I then take you to the next phase, we have to stop doing that. But the next phase must be that we've put too much in the way of greenhouse gases up there already. If the Arctic Circle region is heated up so rapidly and its impacts on the whole world, we've already passed that tipping point. So I'm saying, think again. We have to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere at scale. And the work at Cambridge is now focused on only projects can, that can remove more than a billion tons a year. We're looking to see if we can manage 30 or 40 billion tons a year, and it'll take us to the end of the century, even at that rate, to get a manageable planet, which I believe is more like 350 parts per million. Third thing is, how do we get time on our side? We have to learn to refreeze the Arctic. And I leave you with this. The group that uh, I've set up in Cambridge is already working with a global consortium on how we can refreeze the Arctic. And it's, this is not putting sulfates into the stratosphere, which I think is very dangerous. Uh, but we are looking at other viable technologies. We have to roll them forward as quickly as we can. If we can keep for those three polar months, the ice that has grown during the North Pole winter over the Arctic Ocean, we have a chance because the ice will grow year on year and we begin to reflect sunlight back again. 
but we will have to repeat the process of reflecting sunlight away from the Arctic Ocean every year until we've brought greenhouse gases down to a reasonable level. Methane, critical. Let's make sure that we know how to trap methane. Carbon dioxide, of course, but methane hasn't been given enough attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, for that uh, keynote address. Um, next up, we will be hearing from two of the scientists working most closely with us at Met Methane Action, Dr. Robert Jackson and Dr. Renaud de Richter. And both will be speaking about the science of methane removal. So Rob is a professor in Stanford's Earth Systems Science Department. He is the Michelle and Kevin <coughs> Provostial Professor and Senior Fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment and at the Precourt Institute for Energy. Rob also chairs the Global Carbon Project, the premier academic institution tracking global greenhouse gas emissions. And with his free time, he serves on the board of Methane Action. So thanks for joining us, Rob. Thank you, Daphne. And, and thank you all for, for your attention and for your interest in climate. And uh, I'll and, and Renault will build on what Congresswoman Pingree and Sir Dave have said. And um, let me share my screen just briefly. It's a pleasure to be here. And someone in our group can mention if it's the wrong view, but I'll be talking about methane removal and mitigation. And as I, I want to begin by saying that all of us involved in, in, in pursuing research in methane removal have spent our careers and our livelihoods really mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. In my group, we uh, map street leaks of methane and look at appliances and homes and oil and gas wells. So we're, we all know that mitigation is the first order of business. But as, as Dave mentioned, we've run out of time to, uh, to simply mitigate, we believe, and want to pursue research into methane removal. And that's the focus of the, the talk that I'll be giving today, why that's important and how we might do that. Just to put a little flesh on the, the bones of methane rising, not only is methane rising uh, faster relatively than carbon dioxide is, but the pace of increase is also going up. The increases in the last two years of 16 and 17 parts per billion were the biggest in the past 40 years. And we don't completely understand why that is. Um, probably methane sources are increasing, but sinks may be slowing so that the lifetime of, of methane in the atmosphere expands too. And that's one of the themes that I'll cover today. We need to think about reducing those sources and mitigating methane emissions, but also uh, adjusting the sinks too. So methane's going up, it's going up even faster than it has before. So why methane? You've heard quite a bit about this already. It's, it's, it's very potent. Um, in the last decade, methane was responsible for two thirds as much warming as carbon dioxide. Um, and every, there are a lot of numbers for different global warming potentials. Uh, Congresswoman Pingree used 25. Um, Sir David correctly mentioned that uh, you know, instantaneously it's more than 100. We had a paper out last year led by Sam Abernathy, a PhD student, and we believe that if the time frame of 1.5 degrees C is the goal that's important to you, then the valuation of methane should be at least 75. In other words, one ton of methane released causes 75 times the warming of carbon dioxide over the time frame between now and when we expect to reach um, 1.5 C increases, if that happens, uh, heaven forbid. So it's very potent and, 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 uh, and there's many good reasons to, to reduce it. And, and some for some justifications, uh, it's the only lever at our disposal to reduce temperatures quickly. And by quickly, I mean over a few decades to reduce peak temperature thresholds um, and to delay them as well. And our estimates are that each billion tons of methane that's either mitigated or removed from the atmosphere will lower mean global temperatures by 0 0.2 degrees C. And importantly, and beneficially will also reduce surface ozone by one parts per billion because uh, methane as a hydrocarbon is involved in, in, uh, in ozone formation. And a one, P, one PPB ozone reduction would improve crop yields around the world. It would also save 50,000 lives a year independent of the benefits for climate. So there are a lot of good reasons, both temperature wise, climate wise and health wise for us to act quickly to, uh, to address methane emissions. 
Well, we can we can reduce methane in the atmosphere by uh, mitigating it. So all of the arrows that are upwards in this figure are sources of methane to the atmosphere. The biggest two that we're familiar with are energy, fossil energy use on the left, about 100 million tons a year, and agricultural activities, primar primarily cattle. Uh, the middle green arrow is, is the natural source of, of wetlands, the biggest in the world, uh, of methane, which is the, the biggest natural source in the world. This is the arrow that we're worried about increasing with warming temperatures if, for instance, tropical wetland emissions go up or if the permafrost thaws. So not only do we have to worry about and be concerned about mitigating methane emissions from human activities, we have to consider scenarios where, where methane starts to be released from natural systems very quickly. But not only do we want to tackle sinks, uh, or, I'm sorry, sources, we want to tackle the downward arrows on the right. These are the, the sinks uh, that are natural detergents for methane in the atmosphere, and also soil microbes. All of these arrows provide options or, or arrows in our quiver, if you will. Let me take just a second uh, to say, what is methane removal? Well, methane removal oxidizes methane in the atmosphere to carbon dioxide. You see that in the reaction shown here. Methane plus oxygen goes to carbon dioxide and water vapor. Methane removal mimics what happens naturally from natural detergents in the air. And it's important to realize that every molecule of methane that goes to the atmosphere turns into carbon dioxide over time. So obviously it would be better if we could turn methane into something that weren't a greenhouse gas. But by converting it to carbon dioxide, we are simply speeding the natural process. We can do this using catalysts or other methods I'll come to in a minute and Renault will discuss. Another important aspect to methane removal is there's no storage remove, uh, storage uh, required as there is for carbon dioxide. We're not putting methane underground or anything like that. We're simply grabbing it in the atmosphere, oxidizing it and releasing it again. And so it's uh, to speed up what nature does naturally. If you're interested, some background information on methane removal can be found in these three recent papers, and they'll be uh, in the slides that, uh, that are available to people. Some technologies that appear promising for methane removal. There are catalysts, both photocatalysts that use light, like titanium dioxide, um, metal catalysts embedded into uh, high surface area frameworks like zeolites. Uh, there are aerosols uh, or uh, processes that enhance the, the chlorine and OH radicals that scrub methane from the air naturally. So you can think of, of generating these aerosols and releasing them into the air potentially to oxidize methane. And then we can do things to uh, increase the activity of microbes in the soils as well to speed up the, the natural sink that microbes provide. All of these things are in play and, and deserve research in our view. One last point I'd like to make is that research on methane removal will improve our ability to mitigate methane because most methane emissions in the world are at relatively low concentrations. They're above uh, two parts per million where the, where the background concentration is, but, but below 2000 parts per million. And the important thing to realize here is there's a technology gap. We have no mitigation capabilities now when the concentration of methane falls below 2000 ppm. So if we can foster research to oxidize or remove methane at these low concentrations, yes, we want to be able to, to do that in the atmosphere, but we want to start at concentrations above atmospheric too. Coal mine gas that might be at 2000 ppm, dairy gas that might be in the hundreds of ppms. So in other words, start with sources, what you would effectively call mitigation and work our way down to, to true atmospheric removal. So there's an opportunity to improve mitigation by fostering and promoting methane removal research. Finally, I just want to leave, a, leave you on a philosophical note. The UN just began its decade on ecosystem restoration. And what is ecosystem restoration? Well, it's the process of, of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that's been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. We have degraded, damaged, and, and destroyed aspects of the atmosphere. And I believe that restoration should be our goal for the atmosphere. And the only gas that any, anyone on this webinar could live to see restored to pre-industrial concentrations in their lifetime is methane because of the combination of its short lifetime in the atmosphere of only a decade or so, and the fact that active and aggressive mitigation and removal um, could see it uh, drop back to, uh, to pre-industrial levels of say 700 parts per billion. That will be very difficult and no one on this call believes it will be easy, 
but we want research to pursue that as a goal. And I think restoration is a wonderful framework to, to view healing of the atmosphere. So that's enough for me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Congresswoman and uh, Sir David again, and I'll turn it over to Renaud. Thank you, Rob. So Renaud De Richter, PhD, is the science advisor to Methane Action. Dr. De Richter has been working on greenhouse gas removal for 10 years with a particular focus on methane removal. And he is joining us from France. Thanks for being with us, Renaud. Many thanks, Natalie, and many thanks to all of you for attending. I will share you my screen. So I will present you a quick overview of some methods for atmospheric methane removal. Of course, this will not be exhaustive. The scientific articles on methane removal propose several methods. One of them, several of them are nature-based methods which enhance the natural things of methane directly in the troposphere where wind and natural diffusion takes place. So as Rob said, no need of capture, no need of sequestration. The scientific articles also mention nature-based methods which enhance methane consuming microbes as well as natural ways by which methane producing microbes can be inhibited. Last but not least, there are also technological methods that speed up the natural oxidation of methane, for example, using catalysts, which have already proven to be safe and effective in the laboratory. There are many challenges for the uh, technological uh, applications uh, because methane is quite diffuse in the troposphere. It's only two ppm, two parts per million, so treating large volumes of air will be necessary, either using devices exposed to large volumes of air, such as catalytic coatings on buildings, infrastructures, or vehicles, or by using air moving devices, which will drive diffused methane through the catalysts. Here you have two real pictures, real photographs of existing buildings uh, architects use solar chimneys and double skin walls in order to generate passively an airflow for ventilation purposes. And we can take advantage of this uh, airflow if we add photocatalysts or catalysts which remove methane. And so we can have a kind of decentralized methane removal. There are also other methods, other devices. Uh, here is also an, a real photograph of an existing building in China. It's a solar chimney built four years ago and devoted to remove fine particle pollution uh, with filters. Uh, under the canopy at the feet of the chimney, we can generate hydroxyl radicals or we can add photocatalysts in order to transform methane into carbon dioxide and water. What is interesting with solar chimneys is that they can process very large volumes of air. Solar graph chimneys generate heat in order to move air and then to produce electricity thanks to turbines which are at the feet of the chimney. And if we add catalysts which remove methane, uh, we can uh, reduce the methane concentrations using solar power. Here is an artist's view of what an hypothetical 200 megawatt solar chimney power plant, which can generate about 600 gigawatts per hour per year of renewable electricity, which is carbon dioxide free. But what is interesting is that the airflow through this solar chimney is about 600 uh, 200 cubic kilometers per year. Uh, and this amount of air contains about 8,000 tons of carbon dioxide, uh, representing more than 700,000 uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, I already showed this uh, slide, but I insisted a lot on the technological methods. But I want to say that the nature-based methods which enhance the natural things are also very promising and important. There are bad news and there are good news. Uh, already mentioned that uh, the bad news is that the methane, the natural methane oxidation can keep up with today's high emissions. So methane concentrations are at record highs and rising faster and faster. 
the, the good news is that the global methane pledge signed last year um, during the COP26 targets to reduce by 30% the anthropogenic emissions. Another good news is that so far, more than 120 countries signed the Global Methane Pledge. The bad news is that the natural emissions are growing, in particular from tropical wetlands. And another bad news is that man-made global warming will further increase these biogenic emissions. But the good news is that methane removal is complementary to methane mitigation and can deal with natural methane emissions as well as with the anthropogenic ones, which are difficult to mitigate. And these are real reasons for hope. Uh, Rob also already mentioned some co-benefits. Reducing methane has many co-benefits for public health and food security, as methane is a precursor of ground level ozone, which causes health damage and lowers crop yields. Uh, last year, the Global Methane Assessment published by the United Nations and the Climate and Clean Air Coalition showed that if we reduce, if we succeed reducing by 45% the methane emissions, we can prevent every year additional um, uh, quarter million deaths of humans, and we can also prevent every year uh, the additional crop losses of about 26 million tons. Of course, uh, this 45% methane emission reductions, it's much higher than the global methane pledge targets. But the good news is that adding methane removal to methane mitigation would make it more feasible and even to exceed it. This is my last slide. I would say that as a conclusion, methane removal in addition to aggressive methane mitigation can keep with reach the Paris goal to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And it can succeed bringing back methane to pre-industrial levels that will shave peak temperatures in this century, in this century by 0.6 degrees Celsius. The development of methane removal methods can help prevent a methane feedback loop, but also it can prepare us to deal with a possible methane burst due to hypothetical uh, destabilization of submarine methane hydrates or to the a massive release of methane from towing permafrost. So for all these reasons, methane removal research and development deserves funding and uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and other recent United States bills can be used for funding this research and uh, it will be discussed later by other panelists. Thank you very much for your attention. Now, we have a question for uh, Renault and possibly for Rob. There are projects doing direct air capture of CO2 and moving a lot of air for that purpose. Would it be possible for them to add catalytic coatings to address methane at the same time? Um, who wants to answer that question? Rob, do you want to go ahead? I can take it briefly and turn it over to Renault. I've uh, actually kind of written about this a fair bit. It makes sense if we're going to expend all the money and the energy to move large volumes of air, not to handle one greenhouse gas at a time, in my opinion. So I think it, it's an aspirational goal that when, whenever we're doing uh, capture or removal of any greenhouse gases, we think about the full suite, carbon dioxide, methane, and long-term uh, nitrous oxide too. We don't really have the capabilities to do removal for, for methane and nitrous oxide yet, but we're working on that. So yes, I think it makes perfect sense. Uh, all over the world, we, we move air through air handling systems, not just in CDR cases. Did you want to add to that, Renaud? I fully agree. We can uh, make profit to take advantage of the direct air capture, which already has funding. And uh, if the infrastructure is built, we can add methane removal uh, to the capture of carbon dioxide without uh, reaching, uh, increasing the global costs. So it can be a win-win uh, technology. We've got a question about whether or not the uh, methane removal could and mitigation alone could be sufficient to achieve the Paris goal of not surpassing one and a half degrees. Who would like to know? Rob, do you want to respond to that? I don't want to keep 
I don't want to keep answering. I want to hear from Sir David, but the answer to that question is unequivocally no. We can't reach the, the goals of the Paris Accord without tackling carbon dioxide substantially. Okay. Anything can to I, add? Yeah. Can I just pick up on this very quickly and I'll expand my answer. Um, where are we today? Many people say 1.2 degrees centigrade. That was the average between 2010 and 2020, which the IPCC uses in an extraordinary conservative estimate. Actually, you can just extrapolate that line to the present time, 2022, and we're closing in on 1.35 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. So let's forget about the chances of retaining the 1.5. But I want to also add, please take account of what I was saying about the tipping point in the Arctic Circle region where the temperature is already three degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. So the 1.5 degrees target, if you like, is the wrong target. We should have been aiming to avoid the tipping points. And so we're in a much more serious position than is implied by this question. No, methane capture won't do it. We really have to capture vast quantities of methane and carbon dioxide and get that level total down to 350 parts per million or less. The pre-industrial level was 270 or so. And I'm not, I don't believe we have to get all the way down there to create a safe future, but 350, that's a sort of conservative estimate of where we need to be. Um, I've, uh, I've gotten a question from someone in the audience who wants to get clarification on the concept of restoration. Uh, can we now say for sure that restoring the climate will require restoring both the atmosphere to greenhouse gas levels back to pre-industrial levels and restoring ecosystems such as polar ice caps and not just atmospheric restoration? Dave, did you want to take that and then perhaps others can chime in? Yeah, I was looking for the question on the chat. Uh, um, Carol Grass, uh, please clarify the concept of restoration. While you're looking, uh, Rob, did you want to chime in? I can answer briefly. Sure, I, I use the term atmospheric restoration in, in my talk, and I, I think it's appropriate to consider, you know, for which gases do we have a reasonable hope of restoring or returning them to to or close to pre-industrial levels? And over the lifetime of anyone on this call, the only gas for which that's possible, in my opinion, is methane. And that's because methane is relatively short-lived in the atmosphere, only a decade or so. So if we could really slash methane emissions and couple that with some atmospheric removal, we could see methane return to 7, 800, 900 parts per billion within a few decades. We really don't have that option for any other, any other greenhouse gas because the other gases are longer lived. But to clarify the question for, for Carol, uh, restoring a greenhouse gas to, to a pre-industrial level is a motivating factor in my view. It's something to work towards, to strive to. But of course, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't fix the earth. It wouldn't replace the tipping points that we pass. So it's not a, in, it's insufficient in and of itself. It's just something that I believe might motivate people in ways that arbitrary temperature thresholds don't. Oh, go ahead. Dave, did you want to respond? Right. Well, I, I think I think Rob has said uh, much of what I wanted to say. I would say, if we look at methane emissions from the uh, farming area, from agriculture, uh, we know that methane is both from livestock and uh, emissions from livestock and rice production. And because of the remarkable increase in wealth of many of the poorer countries, we're seeing a much, much bigger demand for meat and rice from the world system as a whole. What we've got to avoid is looking at our own area. Uh, we have to look beyond that. Africa is demanding considerably more meat than before. 20 of African countries are amongst the fastest growing economies in the world. China as well. The demand for meat is driving up livestock production. Uh, so what we need to look at is human behavior in this whole process. This is actually, Rob, you would agree, very challenging. So we, we have a, a tough uh, task ahead of us, and I'm not sure that you and I are going to recognize the economic behavior of human beings when we have learned how to manage all of these problems. 
right? We're going to really need to move into a less consumer driven society around the world and a more well being driven society in which the well being of our ecosystems and our human societies are given equal measure. Yes. Okay. I'm going to give you one final question, Dave, um, and then we're going to go to the governance panel. And um, I encourage any of the scientists to type in their answers um, if you want to take on some of the questions in written form, um, please do so. I'm sorry we don't have time for for all of those questions. So final question from Harvey Austin. Dave, please restate the most frightening Arctic tipping points. Oh, I think by far the most frightening Arctic tipping point is the one that sets the others going, which is the loss of ice over the Arctic Ocean, changing the albedo of the region. That has occurred far more quickly than any of the climate scientists, the theoreticians predicted. And the reason is the feedback effects, which are very difficult to model. Feedback effect number one now is the exposure of the Blue Sea to sunlight, which then causes more ice to be lost than before. But there's another interesting point, the big feedback from the soot that forms on the surface of the of, of the uh, ice uh, over the year and then as the ice melts the soot doesn't disappear it all accumulates in the surface of the ice and so the ice becomes blackened and the black ice of course absorbs much more sunlight big feedback i won't go on about the feedbacks but another one is the formation of lakes on the surface of a large volume of ice and these lakes as they deepen get bluer and absorb more sunlight these are all quite difficult things to include in the modeling and none of them have been included but if we look at the observations we'll see that both the volume of ice and the surface coverage of the oceans has been diminished dramatically over the last 20 years which coincides with the period of this rapid heating of the arctic and that isn't over it's still rising more and more rapidly. Thank you. So this next panel was pre-recorded in order to allow for the participation of two of our guests who were unable to join us live and will cover governance of methane mitigation and removal. We are joined by four distinguished panelists whose impressive credentials are too extensive to provide here in full. So briefly, let me introduce them. Derwood Zelke is the founder and president of the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development in Washington, D.C. and in Paris, where he focuses on fast mitigation strategies that avoid maximum warming over the next decade to slow climate feedbacks and avoid tipping points. We are also joined by Will Burns, who is the director of the Carbon Dioxide Removal Project in Northwestern University's Energy Policy and Culture Program. His research focus is on carbon dioxide removal governance issues, especially in the context of marine-based approaches. And we are joined by Zarin Osho from India, where she is the India Climate Law and Policy Advisor at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, where she focuses on fast mitigation strategies to protect the climate, including reducing short-lived climate pollutants, and finally, we're joined by John Fitzgerald, who is counsel to Methane Action, for whom he has drafted congressional testimony, the Methane Declaration, comments on EPA's oil and gas rules, and many other comments to Congress and the uh, White House. So starting with Durwood, in addition to the Global Methane Pledge, what more can and should be done to rein in rising methane emissions? So climate's a problem of time and temperature. It's too hot. We have too little time to bend the warming curve down. We know that cutting methane is the single biggest and fastest opportunity for reducing warming in the future, nearly 0 0.3 degrees uh, Celsius by the 2040s. And then we have the possibility of methane removal as well. So how do we take the pledge, which is terrific, 121 countries now around the world have followed the lead of the US and Europe and said, 
uh, we agreed to work globally to reduce methane by 30% by 2030, below the 2020 baseline. That's not the maximum, but it's a very good start. It's also not a binding agreement. It's merely a pledge that is the first step. Now, what's the ultimate goal? Well, it's to develop a mandatory agreement inspired by the Montreal Protocol, which is our best climate treaty. People don't know this, but the Montreal Protocol, originally designed to protect the stratospheric ozone layer, uh, has also done more for climate than any other agreement. In fact, cutting the fluorinated gases that uh, are targeted by the Montreal Protocol has avoided warming that otherwise would have equaled what CO2, carbon dioxide, is causing today. That's about 50% little more than 50%. So this treaty has saved us from going over the cliff. And we need to find inspiration in that agreement for a global methane agreement. And then we also need to borrow some of the key architecture. Now, it doesn't fit perfectly. So you want to modify where appropriate. But let's start with the basics. You need a strong scientific assessment panel. Well, for that, you turn to the CCAC, the, uh, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition to Reduce Short-Lived Climate Pollutants in Paris. They have uh, such an assessment panel right now, and it's led by Drew Schindel, brilliant scientist, formerly with NASA, now at uh, Duke. We need to strengthen that, and we need to do it within the CCAC for the first step. And then we need, um, uh, the next piece would be to borrow the Montreal Protocols, TEEP, the Technology and Economic Assessment Panel, and create something that will tell the, the members of the Global Methane Pledge and the rest of the world what the solutions are, including methane removal, what they cost, when they'll come online, how they'll operate. So that piece, again, within the Montreal Protocol, that's been a key part of their success, the TEEP. So we need to create that again, uh, initially within the CCAC. Then you need something like the national ozone units or officers that the Montreal Protocol has in every country of the world, including the 147 developing countries. The richer countries of the world pay institutional support for those offices in the developing world, and they provide training a couple of times a year so that those uh, officers know exactly what to do to solve the, the problem of the Montreal Protocol. And we need something like that, again, for methane. So we need methane officers or methane liaison, uh, liaisons, and we need them to be uh, funded by, uh, initially, I'd say the Global Methane Hub, this group of uh, uh, funding sources that have been put together by philanthropic uh, organizations, now about uh, $300 million. So that's a very good place to start. Then ultimately, we'll also need uh, a more robust funding mechanism, something that gets us into hundreds of millions of dollars Indeed, billions of dollars. Montreal Protocol has the multilateral fund. It's been an essential part of the success of that agreement because it provides funding on a, on a three-year basis for all the developing countries to meet their obligations. It provides the agreed incremental cost. So that's the basically the package that you want for a global methane agreement. Now, I wouldn't stop with a global methane agreement. I'd also look at a food security agreement. Okay, so we know that um, methane and, uh, and food loss are, um, are joined together. And if we can uh, anticipate the coming famine and look at how we're gonna reduce food waste, that's another approach that could be extremely useful. And then finally, I'd say uh, we should be considering an Arctic agreement and I hope that Zarin will talk a little more about this, but you know, the cutting of methane and methane removal is the single most important thing we can do to protect the reflective sea ice and land-based snow and ice in the Arctic. 
-hmm. And if we don't succeed in doing that, it's probably not possible to keep the climate safe because losing that um, albedo just for the sea ice will add the equivalent of a trillion tons of CO2. Uh, and, and then the land-based ice is about the same amount, according to the great scientist at Cambridge, Peter Wadhams, and put that together. And that's almost the same amount of warming that we've put in since pre-industrial times. The world can't survive that. So uh, I'd say those three agreements should be our goal, the Global Methane Agreement, Food Security Agreement, and an agreement to protect the Arctic. Thank you, Derwood. And moving on to Will Burns, you have studied legal frameworks for carbon removal. Give us a sense of where that framework has taken you and what analogs you see for governance of methane removal. What lessons have you learned that we should apply to, to methane removal? Uh, one lesson I think is that a lot of the regulation that we're looking at would likely happen at the domestic level. Uh, uh, when we look at carbon dioxide removal development, for example, uh, direct air capture or bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, uh, a lot of what we're looking at is, uh, is domestic uh, regulatory environments that would be brought to bear or have uh, begun to be brought to bear in terms of development of these projects. So uh, this includes uh, all kinds of land use considerations, right? And the potential impacts that they would have. Uh, it includes uh, potential impacts in terms of, uh, of clean air or clean water associated with the development of, of, uh, of the materials uh, for these products or, or, or the byproducts associated with them. And so uh, we're looking at uh, statutes such as in the United States, uh, including uh, the National Environmental Policy Act or uh, state level uh, regulations that are equivalent, such as CEQA in California, in terms of uh, developing environmental uh, impact assessments of such projects. And I, I think clearly that would be true uh, for uh, development of large scale uh, methane uh, removal uh, uh, projects also. Um, there's a lot of trepidation uh, in the regulatory community uh, about uh, applying uh, current statutory uh, provisions to carbon removal, and I suspect that would also be true in terms of, of methane. And so uh, there's some understanding of how uh, current regulatory systems could be applicable, but there might be a need uh, to fill interstices. Uh, and I think that would probably be true also in terms of, of methane. Uh, at the international level, uh, when we've uh, discussed carbon dioxide removal, we've recognized that some of the approaches we're talking about might have impact across boundaries or in the global commons. Uh, for example, uh, there's a lot of focus on the potential role of ocean-based approaches. So trying to enhance ocean alkalinity by adding things such as olivine or limestone or willastonite uh, to, to uh, these environments. Uh, and in that case, uh, given the fact that there's potential impacts uh, transboundary in the global commons, uh, you have a, a series of international legal principles that might be applicable. Uh, customary international law, uh, the no harm principle, the idea that countries are, uh, are responsible, uh, potentially legally liable for impacts that, uh, that would uh, occur as a consequence of their activities uh, in terms of other countries' interests or in terms of the global commons. And so to the extent that one might deploy approaches uh, that releases substances into the atmosphere, for example, uh, to, uh, to try to reduce methane. Uh, if there are potential byproducts that are produced from that uh, that would have impact in the global commons or in terms of other countries, uh, th some of these principles might be applicable. For example, when we look at uh, uh, deployment of ocean-based approaches, things such as putting iron or phosphorus in the oceans to increase productivity or uh, 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 minerals to try to increase alkalinity, uh, we uh, often discuss the law of the sea convention, right? The idea of, uh, of introduction of pollutants. And uh, that introduction can be through vessels, it can be through the atmosphere, it can be from land, 
Uh, and to the extent that any of the methane removal approaches might uh, introduce those kinds of substances, uh, the law of the sea convention, as well as uh, relevant uh, regional uh, marine uh, pollution conventions might, uh, might also be, uh, be pertinent. Um, and then a last uh, very large issue is the question of moral hazard. Uh, in the context of carbon dioxide removal, there has been um, uh, concern about moral hazards on a couple of levels. So uh, the idea of a, of a moral hazard in the context of carbon dioxide removal has been that if uh, we are led to believe that reducing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere uh, will help ameliorate climate change, it might reduce our focus on reducing our emissions, right? And, and that could have negative impacts on a couple of axes. First of all, if it turns out that carbon removal is not as effective as we believe it is, and we've relied heavily on it to meet uh, the objectives of the Paris Agreement, uh, ultimately, we might find ourselves in 2040 or 2050, for example, or beyond um, overshooting those, uh, uh, those thresholds and, uh, and having to live with the consequences for hundreds or, or thousands of years, right? And the idea is, is that if we do not uh, uh, rely on carbon removal, we might more aggressively decarbonize the world economy and avoid uh, those potential uh, negative implications. So there's concern about that. And I think that would clearly be a concern with, uh, with methane uh, uh, removal approaches also. Um, second of all, the environmental justice community is extremely concerned about carbon removal uh, because they fear that it will permit uh, the uh, fossil fuel industry's life to be extended. And to the extent that there are uh, lots of negative manifestations associated with fossil fuel production beyond carbon dioxide, things such as mercury, for example, as well as the, the impacts of extraction of fossil fuels that disproportionately fall upon vulnerable communities, uh, that those will be extended further if we believe that there's a silver bullet uh, that, uh, that can allow uh, the fossil fuel industry's life uh, to, uh, to continue beyond what it would have with, with highly aggressive decarbonization. And again, I think we'd have some of the same concerns uh, when it came to uh, methane. Uh, methane might also pose an additional concern within the Paris Agreement context because there's a lot of focus on ocean acidification impacts beyond uh, climate impacts and should uh, methane be incorporated into NDCs and thus reduce the need to reduce CO2 uh, that might exacerbate in the longer term ocean acidification impacts. And uh, some parties, especially those that are particularly concerned about uh, ocean ecosystem impacts, uh, uh, might, uh, uh, might object uh, to, uh, to that issue. Um, associated with this also is the final question of public engagement. Uh, uh, in, in the context of carbon dioxide removal, uh, there's been a lot of initial uh, concern about the potential impacts of deploying these approaches in terms of uh, uh, impacts on the on the atmosphere, for example, impacts on other ecosystems, and discussion about how to uh, educate the public about these issues, what role the public ultimately has in deciding if these approaches should be deployed and how one structures public engagement in a meaningful way to engage all potential stakeholders uh, and to provide a balanced uh, sort of, of narrative, right? That both emphasizes the potential negative impacts of these approaches, but also emphasizes the positive benefits, as well as the fact that we've reached a, a point in society where we have to face uh, 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 trade-offs, right, and risks, no matter what we do, whether that be to allow unchecked climate change or to potentially deploy approaches that may have some uncertainty in terms of the risks, uh, but we might deem it acceptable as a society, right? But being able to explain uh, uh, abstruse scientific uh, concepts in a way 
uh, that the public can understand and provide meaningful input is a challenge in terms of carbon removal, and it likely would be in terms of, of methane removal. And so I think those are some of the, the, the lessons that, that, that we've drawn that, that might potentially be applicable. Thank you, Will. Uh, next up is Zarin. You're based in India, one of the top five methane emitting countries in the world. Yet India, along with three out of four of the leading emitters, has not signed the Global Methane Pledge. What prospects do you see for action on methane in India at the subnational level? And what lessons are you learning that could be applied to other countries? You're absolutely right. India is one of the top uh, five emitters in the world for methane. And it has not joined the Global Methane Pledge, but I don't think that should necessarily be a problem. I think that is more to do with the political stance. And uh, India, for example, held on to signing off and ratifying the Kigali Amendment for years. But today, if you look at where India is in terms of acting on the Kigali Amendment, despite it being in Group 2, it, it is faster than group one countries because the industry sort of caught on to it. You know, the, the right economic situations were made in order for India to move forward. So I see a very similar sort of pattern in India. Even though there are political reasons for the Global Methane Pledge not being currently signed on to or being supported by the government of India, but I believe it's only a matter of time. Um, at the Arctic, for example, we have seen the government, the national government, the government of India talk extensively about the impacts of methane. It talks extensively about methane in the context of how it impacts climate change, how it impacts national policy and foreign policy. But at a domestic level, when we look at India's subnational policy, for example, which is where IGST is doing the bottom-up approach, you see that different states in India have something called as the State Action Plan on Climate Change, SAP CCs. That's what they're called in short. Each SAP CC contains sections on methane and black carbon, essentially a non-CO2 bucket of gases. So what we are essentially doing is to handhold states to collate this data in a more formal um, you know, bucket of gases. There is un currently no understanding of um, CO2 and non-CO2. There is currently no understanding of how these two metrics sort of come together. How is it that the two can act together to, con to create the dual approach that Durwood's paper demonstrates? So what, what I believe, very strongly believe, that just because India is not a member of the Global Methane Pledge does not mean that there is no action from India on methane or black carbon or other um, non-CO2 bucket of gases. It is essentially a matter of approach. So if you're able to do, um, if you're essentially able to understand and demonstrate how to work at sub-national level, including on the most controversial sectors like agriculture, um, if I can give you an example of the state of Punjab, Punjab is one of the largest ag economies in India, provincially. And they have the, the biggest burning, the, the biggest issue of burning of um, the, the ag stubble, which then causes ambient air quality issues in Delhi. What are they doing? They're not only trying to control air quality as an issue, they're also trying to make waste, waste to power. So essentially monetize on your waste, control emissions. And they're also in the process of doing biogas plants, which is the waste to energy approach also replacing your nitrogen-based fertilizers. So the byproduct of a waste-to-gas uh, or waste-to-power uh, plant, which is a biogas plant, is slurry, liquid slurry, which they're essentially packaging in these little pouches and selling off at two rupees a kg, which is ridiculously cheap uh, compared to you know, buying a nitrogen-based um, urea for example. So all of these things are actually happening. It is a matter of time to a, educate, which is very important, the public awareness and the public education of why it is that what you're doing makes sense at a national level and therefore at an international level. So, you know, sort of doing the whole value chain, top, bottom, is extremely necessary. And the other thing is, how do you create an incentive-based mechanism so that this is not something that you get a grant for, you do a pilot, you write a report. In fact, this is um, a feedback you know, to your question of what I have learned and what my experience on ground has been. The feedback I have got is, we don't want reports. Everybody in the world has written reports for us. 
from a World Bank to an ADB to a Terry to anybody that you can possibly think of. Everybody comes and gives us data. We have the data. We know the report. How do you operationalize this? That's the, that's the key. And the one thing that IGST has excelled at is essentially to join this gap, to basically plug the gap. And the way we are doing it is by not only using the research, which has been already done by knowledge partners across different states in India, taking that data as the basis for intervention and connecting the states and handholding the states to a point where the private sector comes in, comes in and invests. So biogas is a very profitable venture, which not only looks at your, uh, you know, methane gas emissions, it, it, it has multiple uh, advantages. You have black carbon emission reduction, you have methane reductions, you also remove nitrogen, nitrous oxides as because you're essentially moving away from, uh, you know, inorganic fertilizers and you remove F gases because a byproduct of a biogas plant is heat, heat, which is waste heat. So instead of losing the heat to the atmosphere, you channel it for all the heating purposes. So in this one component or one ecosystem, you get multiple benefits, but the states aren't aware of how to essentially extrapolate the data of one plant and put it across the entire state and see, okay, how can we, you know, um, A, monetize on this, this particular sector? How do we get investors? And then how do you make policy based on evidence, which is essentially what we are trying to do. So I think in a nutshell, that that is my experience of working in India. And I, I understand that it is a challenge that you do not have explicit support of the national government for the global methane plant. But as Durwood said, it is absolutely necessary to have that given what we are fighting or what we are, we are essentially faced with. John, um, you have uh, served as Methane Action's legal counsel and done a great job providing commentary to members of Congress, to the White House and others on EPA and oil and gas rules. Um, tell us what you see that is hopeful in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I know that there are some questions in, in the chat um, from folks on um, how we might get started on, on methane removal. Can you, can you uh, speak to that specifically? And then um, I'll try to open it up to some of these questions that folks aren't able to answer uh, in the dialogues. Thank you, Daphne. I certainly can. But let me put that in context. When we're solving an environmental problem through governance, it starts with understanding the best available methods for producing goods and services in an environmentally responsible way, then sharing that technology, and then, once it's available, requiring that method of your own producers and of the producers of goods that you import. That is how we establish global standards for production in an environmentally friendly manner. We've done it time and again for various things. Uh, including the shrimp and sea turtle situation of the early 1990s. Once these methods are proven out, and in this case with a substantial funding from the IRA, then they can be shared and made part of the requirements of domestic law through the laws that we have already, beginning with the Clean Air Act and several sections of the Clean Air Act. I'll touch on that a little more later. Also, a very powerful tool is the Toxic Substances Control Act, which can require the removal of legacy pollution that has been found to be posing an unreasonable risk to human health or the environment. And we have other laws, like the sewage treatment elements of the Clean Water Act. Sewage treatment emits methane. We can reduce and remove that. So we use these together with the research funding it provided in the IRA and in the appropriations process. And we expedite the development of the very things that Renaud and Rob were talking about ways of dealing with his different scales and ways of scaling up substantially. They then can be supported via trade and aid, added to regulations required under the methane pledge. The methane pledge, as you may recall, not only pledges, but it says we will proceed to develop local domestic regulations to expedite our accomplishment of the methane pledge. Those things can become what, was, what Derwood was talking about, which is a stronger agreement of the kind that methane declaration, that methane action has drafted, but we can add provisions to that from the Montreal Protocol and elsewhere. So we build these things domestically and then share them internationally, and soon we have an international regime. But 
the greatest sign of hope besides the IRA was that the appropriators, including Chairwoman Pingree, in their fiscal year 22 bill, asked the White House and the agencies to respond to Congress and tell them all the different ways of intervening in the climate that may be available and what can be done with them. Methane Action filed its comments in that process days ago, as did many other organizations. We trust that the Office of Science and Technology Policy of the White House will pull together these comments from the EPA and elsewhere and from the public and present a list of options that Congress can support in fairly rapid fashion. This is a terribly important thing because they've never done this. Officially said, climate intervention is important. Let's figure out how to do it and get it done. And we find ourselves then at a point where the government is beginning to catch up with Sir David's basically shaking equivalent, shaking explanation of where we are and how we need to move forward rapidly. So we use those reports and the process of the funding through the IRA and the appropriations process. So how do we do that? We as the citizenry, we as the scientific community, and in particular, it's the Congress and the executive branch. There are five steps that need to be taken. First is to ask the agencies whether they will review the array of methane removal methods and other greenhouse gas removal methods that have been developed, such as what I know talked about, such as in our catalog of research needs, and whether they intend to support increased R&D on those so we can find out what actually really works and how. The second is to establish an interagency climate restoration program using the answers provided by the OSTP and this process to develop a restoration and rehabilitation process such as Rob was talking about to restore the degraded ecosystem that is the climate and the way it affects every other ecosystem on earth, which by the way, is one of the commands of the Convention on Biological Diversity in Article 8F, restore degraded ecosystems. Number three, to add methane removal to the Cantwell Collins Crest Bill and similar CO2 removal bills introduced by Representative Tonko and Peters and others so that we have not only greenhouse gas CO2, but we also have methane removal testing and pilot programs. Those bills would say, we are gonna do pilot programs. You will do those programs in the field to find out what works. Number four, we integrate this process with the methane pledge for a more enforceable methane declaration or agreement, as Gerald would say. Number five, we continue to provide oversight and appropriations as we proceed to ensure that we're able to deploy removal methods with an efficient, sufficient scale and speed to avoid further tipping points, and then to move on to restore the climate to a healthy condition. If I have any more time, I'll tell you some of the specific things that are in the IRA that are very hopeful, but if I don't, I'll be quiet. You don't, you don't, very I'm well. sorry. Good job of ending at the top of the hour. We do have a half an hour left. Um, I see an awful lot of questions that remain unanswered in the Q&A. Derwood, are you still with us? We have someone who has asked you to elaborate on the TEEP idea. Kathleen says it's a great idea. Can you can you elaborate on that? T-E-A-P. Yes. Uh, so the the Montreal Protocol has the TEEP, the Technology and Economic Assessment Panel, and it uh, reviews the alternatives to the chemicals that are being phased out or phased down under the Montreal Protocol, how they operate in different temperature zones, uh, what their cost is, how they fit into your old equipment, or do you need new equipment? And they work hand in hand with the dedicated funding mechanism of that magnificent agreement, the multilateral fund. So they're able to say, these are the new solutions. Here's what they cost. You over here in the multilateral fund have agreed through the, through the Montreal Protocol to provide the incremental funding uh, for, excuse me, I don't know who the hell that is. Uh, someone on my front door. Um, scared scared me um to uh we've agreed to provide the incremental funding and so now you've told us what that is for the solutions so it works um, brilliantly and we can recreate that there are differences between methane and fluorinated <laughs> gases <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't know who somebody's soliciting something um but the um uh 
I'm not the I'm not the only one having technical difficulties, but yeah, I'm um, having my own technical difficulties. Okay, there. I think that's good enough for the moment. I'll, okay. I'm going to shut my door. <laughs> okay. Um, I see uh, that Alexander Hastings is asking: Are there any methane removal strategies that are ready or nearly ready for deployment? Or do each of the potential strategies require additional research prior to deployment? Um, that's for Rob or Renault to answer. Rob, do you want to take a first crack at it? Sure. My answer would be that none of the technologies that we've highlighted here are ready to, to deploy commercially at scale. And I, and I say that particularly the at scale part and thinking about uh, getting input um, from people and depending on the technology being used, uh, considering governance and social factors as well. There are many things in play here. That, that's my answer. And um, another related question is, uh, what are the rate limiting factors? Um, what's, what's limiting our ability to get to scale? Renaud? Let Renaud, yeah, let Renault take, take that. We have to start by research uh, and develop the uh, prototypes and uh, test them and also to do, perform some environmental impact assessments. Uh, and uh, implement uh, governance uh, before starting uh, large scale. So there are many steps before we reach that. Okay. Can and should building codes be changed to require methane removal? That's an interesting question. Who wants to take that one on? One of the scientists probably, but um, we can also deal with the governance. Renaud, did you want to quickly respond to that? And then I'll turn to John. I didn't understand the first word. Uh, should building codes be changed to require methane removal? I know that you've talked about trombe walls and ways of cooling that could also simultaneously uh, remove methane. Yeah, I don't think that the codes are to be changed, uh, but maybe John has some other ideas Go to ahead. answer. Go ahead, John. Sure. Um, the the uh, questioner, is asking a very broad question. And the answer basically is yes. And in fact, the building codes of the United States require a certain minimum designs for buildings in order to be healthy and safe and that sort of thing. And recognizing that the IRA includes grants specifically for discretionary grants to state and local governments, including the updating of building codes. And if we were really smart, what we'll do is test out the kinds of things that Renault was talking about adding to buildings and saying, if you can do this, we're going to require this in major commercial buildings or other buildings and urban centers that are capable of having these kind of skins on the outside to channel air and remove pollutants as well as perform other functions. So that's the kind of thing we can get to with the help of the IRA. Can I, can I just respond quickly? Um, sorry, uh, I, I guess I don't think that it's appropriate for us to suggest building codes be changed before we have a technology that's that's you know that's in place but what we should be doing right now and is starting to happen is reducing fossil energy use within homes right we can the, the fastest thing we could do right now would be to continue the process of electrification and reduce gas use in our homes absolutely i have to say that we're talking about time scales i wouldn't ever jump into something and require it overnight we're talking about a long scale process. The IRA is a decade long set of investments in the reconciliation bill. They're looking many years out. And this is where we start looking at these things. And then as Rob say, when we find out what works, what's safe, as we assess the impacts, then we add those to building codes, not tomorrow. Okay, Derwood, did you have something to add? Well, just, uh, there are some jurisdictions that are starting to ban uh, fossil gas hookups in new buildings already. You know, that, that's a very good start. Let's get rid of the, the gas appliances and move to heat pumps, for example. Do either of you want to respond, Rob or Renault, to the question, what do you view as the most promising approaches to reducing methane production from methanogens in wetlands and or enhancing methane uptake by methanotrophs from Jessica Swanson? I missed the first clause. Uh, what do you view as the most promising approaches to reducing methane production from methanogens and enhancing methane uptake by methanotrophs? So the microbe 
Yeah, so. um, I'll just answer briefly. There are people and even companies that have already tried to to generate slurries with microbes. So rather than oxidizing the methane catalytically, and, and most most of the catalysts are based on bio sort of bio related uh, chemistry anyway. But um, so there are people trying to generate sort of high density microbial slurries to to capture and oxidize that methane. I think those approaches are worth pursuing. And like like all of them, they're difficult at uh, you know the the million ton scale. But um, but yeah. we have to, we have to try everything in my view. And then in terms of chemical, the chemical equation, is it possible to split methane to carbon and clean hydrogen? It is, sorry to jump in again, it is certainly possible. Of course, almost all the industrial hydrogen made in the world today is made that way from, from gas. But I think it's not the best approach when we're talking about uh, dilute uh, methane streams and oxidation from the air. Then you have to do two very difficult things in a row or sequentially. So I think we would we would do obviously producing hydrogen with it would be better than making carbon dioxide. But I think if we could just do one step, oxidizing methane to carbon dioxide, that should be our goal now. And then if we can tap in utilization or something else later, that's great. But um, let's do the first order of business. And I've got a question for Renault. How is the research into passive methane chimneys coming along? Has one been built? Yeah, for the moment, uh, research is going on in Edinburgh in UK, uh, but on very small scale. Um, and uh, the chimney in China, it's uh, only for removing the dust and the uh, particles. Uh, and so the photocatalytic uh, research is going on, but uh, still not on big solar chimneys. Um, I've got a question from Stefan Singer, who says, what can civil society organizations do to support the work on methane mitigation and removal um, in the context of science, lifestyle changes, tipping points, while not reducing pressure on the necessary phase out of fossil fuels? Who would like to take that? John, go ahead. One of the other good pieces of uh, good news from the IDA is that there is substantial funding for citizen participation. And in fact, organizations can qualify for grants to remediate their local environmental ambient air um, under the IDA, uh, grants from the EPA. And so that's one step. Another step is that the administration has begun to award attorneys and expert witnesses fees for citizens to participate in agency proceedings, beginning with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which moves natural gas about the country and quality controls that process. And so we can empower citizens, even as they need to hire experts and attorneys to help them participate in this process. And so that's the sort of procedural answer to the question. The substantive answer is, well, we're all trying to help people learn what we can do. So I'll stop there. Um, Peter Finley asks, of the kinds of mitigation and removal methods that have been mentioned, which one is most advanced in its use currently and what looks most promising given the urgency of time? Rob, do you want to answer that? Um, I think different families have different advantages. I personally believe that uh, catalytic approaches and mimicking sort of bio-based catalysis is, a, is an important approach. But in, in all those processes, you have to move the air and contact the air with the catalyst, and that's uh, that has its challenges. There are um, yeah, fruitful avenues for re uh, releasing um, radicals or oxidizing agents into the air, so you don't have to push that air through, the, um, through a system. So you bring the oxidizing agent to the, the methane rather than moving the methane to a to a catalyst. So I, I don't think there's a, a clear winner yet in my view. I think we need research on all of those approaches, including microbial ones too. Uh, Terry Smith asks, have you looked into the use of biochar for the sequestration of methane? Anybody wants to answer that? Yeah, in fact, there is a lot of uh, publications uh, showing that uh, biochar can be used for mitigation or of methane. But methane removal doesn't need any sequestration. Methane removal consists in oxidizing, accelerating the natural oxidation. So there is no uh, um, sequestration needed for uh, methane removal. But there are, of, of course, many, many papers uh, about methane mitigation with biochar. Um, and 
I'll give this one to Derwood. Um, PB Barnard says, I'd love to hear the speaker's views on our chances of success in methane removal and climate restoration or repair more broadly if humanity does not also embark on an ambitious program of degrowing de our global economy. Most of us know our, how our numbers and appetites are undermining all of our best efforts to solve our planetary and societal crisis. Okay, well, that's uh, that's the kind of question that we need to go have a drink to answer. <laughs> but, uh, let me give you a, a couple of thoughts on it. I mean, I think it's this is a profound question. Can we solve climate change in time in the current you know, capitalistic system that we, we now have? Or do we need a, a, a broader revolution of ideas? Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I think about that, but I don't work on that. I work on what we can do today. And it's a tremendous amount on the CO2 energy side. As, as everyone knows, we're doing remarkably well there. Now the non-CO2 side, leading with methane, is the next piece. And we've moved that issue way up on the agenda for policymakers. Now we need to get the money for the research and the deployment. Uh, we need to follow the other advice from Sir David King or Dave on uh, other restoration projects. I mean, there are other things to do with the um, Arctic sea ice, for example. So uh, it, it's, um, I think we can do most of what we have to do in the current system, but I think about this broader question all the time. Do we really need a bigger revolution, which would have to be led by the young people? I mean, they say, you know, paradigms, uh, the old paradigms never die out, but the people who hold those paradigms do. And so um, there may come a moment uh, when the young people do get to take over and we have a more just and equitable society where we don't have to fight as hard to uh, keep the planet safe. Okay, and Maybe I think Daphne, that... just sorry quickly. Uh, we we had a paper out. A, uh, we had a paper out a couple months ago, just looking at relationships between human well-being and energy use. And the conclusion of that paper is that uh, high energy consuming countries, like here in the United States, that consume two or three times the global average, uh, get very little for the extra energy that we use. When you look at things like life expectancy, infant mortality, pollution and sort of quality and length of life, we don't get a lot. And I think we have to have a discussion about demand side management, reducing consumption of goods and, and changing diets is just as important as mitigating emissions. We can't just build our way out of the climate problem. Okay, well, we have far too many questions than we have time to answer, I'm afraid. Um, but I really appreciate the rich discussion and in particular your patience with all of the various technical problems we've had. I hope you uh, nevertheless gleaned some uh, new uh, insights into the uh, challenge of uh, the methane emergency and what some of these hardworking scientists are working to try to do to solve the problem. Thank you to Derwood and Rob and Renault and Dave and John and all of you for joining us. Hope to see you again on another uh, webinar soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cool.